I'm glad to see you back this morning. And I do understand there are several from other congregations here, and we're thrilled to have you with us as well. We're going to be looking this morning at what our children, what our grandchildren deserve to see. They deserve to see some things. And then uh, in our next hour, we're going to talk about our faith being passed on. And then on the schedule, it says Q&A, but my understanding is we're going to do a short lesson, kind of a special lesson right in there as well. So we're not going to be doing that Q&A. I'm sorry about that, but um, I will have some special things for you in that 30 minutes that I think is going to really benefit you. As a matter of fact, I'll go ahead and tell you what they are uh, without giving you the points to them. Uh, so during that, I think it says 1130 or something like that, right before lunch, that little 30 minutes there, I'm going to give you six things that you should be doing in the event that your child walks away from the Lord. Because many of us have children, grandchildren, nieces or nephews, brothers or sisters. And I am convicted because of working with some people that there should be some things that we should be doing. Oftentimes it just we limit it to prayer and prayers all together right. And that's going to be one of them, okay? But what kind of a prayer? We're going to talk about that. And then what are some other things that you should be doing? Because I'm convinced that we want to make sure that when Judgment Day comes, we have done everything that we could possibly do to get them to heaven, to bring them back. Because we do have free will, don't we? I mean, at any point, even this very day, if you want to walk away from the Lord, you can do that. He's not going to force you. He wants you to be his child. And yet, our children make their own choices. They become accountable. So that's what we're going to be talking about, and I think that'll be beneficial to us. You know, as we look at this idea of what your children and grandchildren deserve to see, I want to start out with guiding your minds towards the Old Testament there was a point at which they started begging God Almighty to give us a king. And God said, that's not my plan. Because your king needs to be me, God Almighty. I'm your king. Yeah, well, we know that, but other nations, right? We do this all the time. I know God, but other churches, <laughs> right? Other nations, other people are doing this. And we think it's, I mean, it's kind of working for them. It should work for us. And God goes, okay. You know, this is the weird thing about the sovereignty of God. When we talk about the sovereignty of God, we're talking about a God who is a God of, the, you know, the 360 view. He sees everything coming and going. He sees behind it and before it and everything in between it. And we don't get to think that way. We, we don't see that way. We're very limited, aren't we? But we serve a sovereign God. And the amazing thing about serving a sovereign God is that when we do, go, you know, do our own will, if we'll come back to him and keep our heart right, God can still do amazing things in your mistake. Sometimes we think that we or our children or our parents or whatever, we make such a mistake in our lives that there's no bouncing back from it. And yet, one thing that you have to learn from the Old Testament, if you read it again, is that even when someone goes directly against the law of the Lord, directly, directly against the will of God, God can take that mess and do amazing things with that person. And he did it with the Israelites. <clears throat> we want a king. So eventually what happened was, <clears throat> over time, the Israelites had 38 kings. 38-ish. 
There's some that we don't, you know, they're just a matter of days and we don't really count them or whatever. But approximately about 38 kings of Israel, 19, and kings of Judah, 19. All of these 38, all men, the kings of Israel, the 19, every single one were godless men leading God's people. Of the kings of Judah, eight were God-fearing, righteous men. None of, it, none of Israel... Eight of Judah. Of the eight, God-fearing, righteous men, two had a son. Only two had a son that were righteous. Of the two boys that were righteous, one produced a grandson that was righteous. The point is, the further we go with each generation, each generation, generally speaking, gets spiritually weaker. So what must we do? My brothers and sisters, we must do things very intentionally if we're going to produce a generation beneath us that's upright. We, we must. It's crucial that we do. If not, here's what you get. What you get is you get a father who knows God. Let's think about three men. You get a father who knows God, and he loves God with all of his heart, and he serves his God, and he has a firsthand faith, and active, active in work, active in worship, in the kingdom of God, and this man loves God. But if this man does not do what he's supposed to do, he ends up producing a son, a second generation. That, by the way, also knows God, but it's a little different. He knows about the works of God, and he serves the son, he serves the God of his father. And he has a second-hand faith, which produces, by the way, and you'll see the son in church because he's a churchgoer, as we talked about last night. He comes and he fills his spot in the pew. And, and by the way, this son of this father, this first-hand faith, this son, he also uh, will occasionally maybe even do a devotional, a prayer, lead the Lord's Supper. But see, he's doing it all based on his father's God, not his God. He has a secondhand faith. Why is that? Because this, this man who had a firsthand faith didn't do what he was supposed to do in his home. He made a lot of assumptions. The assumption was, if I have this faith, he will automatically have this faith because Hopefully he sees that in me and instead of, you know, being directly connected to his son and training him and teaching him in the ways of the Lord and bringing him, you know, through these different stages of life with faith, he just assumes he's going to have it. And so the son has a secondhand faith. And you know what happens then? The son produces a son, a grandson, who knows not God. Why? Because his daddy's a churchgoer and not a disciple. And so the grandson knows not God. He doesn't know the works of the Lord. He serves false gods like work and hobbies, money, worldly living. And he has no faith at all and only time he comes through the doors are during special days when his son or his, when, when his father or his grandfather begs him to come. 
he'll come on special days, right? Easter, Christmas, maybe Father's Day, and hopefully Mother's Day, he'll be here. Does this concept come home to us? Because, brethren, if we're not doing things purposefully, with intention, to make sure that our children and our children's children see some very specific things in our life, this is how it plays out. Because I see it, and you see it, we see it over and over. Think about this. If all we did in the Lord's church, because I mean, I don't know how y'all do, if y'all do gospel meetings anymore, but where we're from, they're few and far between. And many of us preachers don't get invited to do gospel meetings anymore because there's not that many going on compared to the way it used to be. But if we get families who are healthy and fathers who are leading, fathers who are making sure that they're taking their children by the hand and their wife by the hand and not just going to church with them, but living a vibrant faith at home. And that God Almighty and Jesus Christ and his word truly is number one in our home. He's not a, you know, on, on the back burner. Then what we'll have is we'll have evangelism happening. Watch this. If all we did were our churches, if all we did were win our children and our grandchildren back to the Lord, this congregation would double in attendance. Your congregation would double or triple. If all you did was teach the gospel and bring those children back to God, or if you don't have, you know, you just barely do have children, if you win them over to Christ Jesus, then our attendance. I mean, we should still go into all the world, but what would happen if all we did was start in our homes with evangelism to make sure that we win them to Jesus Christ? But when the day is done, when the end comes for you, what will you have? The story is told about the, the two vessels, the two ships, that they were paddle boats that met on the Mississippi River, and they were going from Memphis down to New Orleans. And one paddle boat had older sailors on it, <clears throat> an older captain. The other steam-driven paddle boat had younger, a younger captain, younger men running it. And they came up side by side on this vast river. We talk about that river a lot. People on this side will ask me, do I know so-and-so? And I'm like, no, the river's too wide, right? We got to go across that when we go home. And they come up next to each other and they start exchanging words, <clears throat> joking around a little bit. And all of a sudden it gets a little bit serious and they challenge each other. And these are steamboats that are taking, you know, paddle boats that are taking cargo from Memphis to New Orleans. And they start racing. See who can get there the fastest. And here we go. As they go along, the younger crew starts to realize something. That we're running low on coal because we're using it up so much. And so they started taking the cargo and throwing it in to get things heated up so they could go faster. And sure enough, they're going faster than the older crew. And sure enough, the younger crew wins the, wins the race to New Orleans. And they burn all the cargo When the day comes that you have to go home or that the Lord comes back, are you going to be known here as winning the race 
in this world, and yet to win that race, you've burned your cargo? The very beings that you've been called to get to God, to get them to heaven, and you end up with all the stuff, the American dream. You've got the beautiful house, and you've got all the cars, and you've got the boats, and you've got all of your gadgets and all of your stuff, and you've got your kids through all these schools and all of these things, but you've burned the cargo in getting there. And you look up one day, and you've gained the whole world, and you've lost your children and your grandchildren's souls because you didn't show them what they needed to see. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 and chapter 6, here are the words that you hear. Deuteronomy 4, starting in verse 7. For what great nation is there that God has so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason will we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to yourself. In other words, you want to stay great? You better take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself. You know, elders are called to keep themselves in the book of Acts. I mean, Luke writes this and he talks about these elders watching themselves. You keep watch over yourself as you watch over the flock, but you better watch yourself. That's the concept of, well, and it's all throughout the New Testament as well, right? All through the New Testament of making sure that you are faithful as you're calling others to be faithful. And take, take heed lest you fall, right? And he's telling these fathers, he's telling these mothers, you take heed to yourself, diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all of the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren, especially concerning the day that you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb. When the Lord said to me, gather the people to me, and I will let them hear my words that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children. Chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, here's what he says. Now this is the commandment and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land that you are crossing over to possess and that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all of his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged, that your days, in other words, may be blessed. And that theme runs all the way through Scripture, that he is to see us, that they are to see us being diligent in God's word, and that we purposefully make sure that God's word his law is written on their hearts. And I'm here to tell you this morning, that job is your job, not the church's job. Not a paid professional, an associate minister, a youth minister, that's not their job. Proverbs 22 and verse 7, he says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, are y'all, y'all awake this morning? Let's go. When he's old, he will not depart. That's exactly right. Who's he talking to? Is he talking to paid professionals in the church? Or is he talking to me? As a father, right? Your job is to train them, not the church's job. Now, if they get some here, great. But you know, there's many places unlike this where there's just a very small gathering. Whose responsibility is is it then for these little children who are there? It's the parent's job. It's the grandparent's job. It's my job. And our children... If they're going to see this kind of a man, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7, the righteous man 
who walks in his integrity, you know what happens with the children? They're blessed after him. Because he's walking this every day of his life. And he's showing them how to walk it. That's why when you read Proverbs, you read these phrases like, my son, listen to me. The idea is walk with me in this. Watch me do this. My son, chapter five, verse, uh, chapter 5 and chapter 7, my son, do not walk down the path or the street of the wicked woman, the adulterous woman. And he's teaching, he's sharing with his children and his grandchildren how we walk because they deserve, deserve to see some things. Can I tell you this morning, though, as we talk about this concept, there are some things that your children and grandchildren do not deserve. They don't deserve brand name clothing. They don't deserve their own private bedroom. They no matter what, how you've been raised, they don't deserve 24 access to media or an Instagram account or a Twitter account or a TikTok account or whatever accounts out there. They don't deserve it. They don't deserve their own smartphone. No matter what your children and grandchildren say, they don't. Or the latest iWatch, or the latest video game system, or a brand new car at 16, or an allowance, or privacy, or the best education, or conveniences, or comfort, or to go wherever they want to go and do whatever they want to do. They don't deserve any of that stuff. Society has talked us into that. It's a bill of goods that we've bought. And Satan's lying to you. He's been lying to me. To act like because we brought them into this world, they have all these things that they deserve. And then they start seeing all the other children who have the same mentality, right? The same expectation that they deserve these things. And they don't. So oftentimes what we do is we measure the state of our children by the wrong standards because we think they deserve these things. And George Barna, in his book, Revolutionary Parenting, that I mentioned last night, it'd be a great one for you to read. He says, here's the criteria that's used to assess the condition of today's children. Are they provided for for their basic needs, food, clothing, and shelter? Are they physically healthy, performing at or beyond their grade level, he says, in a secure and comfortable home, monitored and cared for by children involved in church services and programs, connected with decent friends, not involved in gangs, not taking drugs, not alcoholics, not out of control sexually, not involved in a cult or satanic activity, not the victim of physical or emotional abuse, without a criminal record or related problems. And his next argument, listen to this, his next argument is this. These are the wrong standards. You're not likely to get the right outcome if you base your actions on the assessment of the wrong things. What, what I'm trying to tell you is, if we're measuring our success of raising our children by these things, we've picked the wrong standards. Because, yeah, we should provide for them and provide a home that's safe and make sure that they're educated on some level. That's good. All that stuff's good. But our calling as disciples is to create disciples out of our children. And that we turn our children and our grandchildren into spiritual champions. That's the assessment. Do, in other words, when they leave my home, do they have the ability to bring others to Christ Jesus? Not just did we educate them. Do, do they stand up for their God, for Christ Jesus? Do, do they know, do they really know how to share the love of God with others? Are, are they a holy life as we've been called? So yes, there are some things that your children deserve and your sh grandchildren surely deserve to see. And I want to give those to you this morning. There's about four things. This first one though, 
has some stuff attached to it. Number one, here's what your children deserve to see. They deserve to see that sin is black and white. They deserve to see that because you're in, a, you're in a place, you're in a world right now that right is not always right and wrong is not always wrong. But for the Christian, may I tell you, right is always right. And no matter the circumstances or the situation, wrong is always wrong. A lie is always a lie, even if there's truth in it. Can I get a head nod? Do we have anybody that agrees with me? It's okay if you don't. I'm just telling you, I'm telling you biblically speaking, a lie? Look, look at Abram and Sarai. Half lie, still lie, still wrong. No matter how you've been taught that or read that and go, well, why didn't, why didn't God condemn? You know, there's a lot of things. We, we take different isolated stories in the Old Testament and go, God must not think this whole, marriage, you know, having seven wives is a bad thing. I mean, look at David. Look at Abram. Look at all that, you know, he lied. He has wives, all these different things. And yet we forget that that's not a good way to study the Bible. Just because God didn't outline everything from that narrative doesn't mean that he thinks it's right or wrong. We, we have to really study the Bible right to come up with these concepts. You know, there was good done when Ananias and Sapphira brought the, the funds and laid it at the apostles' feet. There, were, there was good done in that. Are you with me? There was good in that. Acts chapter 5. They still lied. Still wrong. But what I'm telling you is, we do sin in this culture based on circumstances and situation. And God doesn't. God doesn't. So there must be discernment. There must be good discernment. There must be a process that we teach our children of what's right and what's wrong. And so I'm going to give you the process this morning. These are the... These are the eight things that my parents gave me when I was a little bitty boy, and I've used them all of my life to discern whether something is right or wrong. Are you ready for these eight things? Well, they're going to go quickly, so write them down quickly, okay? Number one is this. Let's look at them. What does the Bible say? Can you find it in the Bible? 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, his divine power has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. It's probably in there, but you know what? It may not be in there directly. It may be in there indirectly or by concept or by principle. But most things, you can find out that lying is wrong by using the Bible. You can, you can find out that murder is wrong. They call it abortion. Bible calls it murder. You can find out that the murder of in, the innocent is wrong, Proverbs 6, by using the Bible. Right? And then there's some things, though, that we're not really sure of because the Bible doesn't say it specifically. Well, then I gave you seven more things. Okay? Number two, would my Lord do it? Right? 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. We ought to walk as he walked. We need to be asking. Well, the only way to do this right then is to study Jesus and to study him a lot if we're going to find out if he would do something or not. But I will tell you, these first two have basically answered every question that I've ever had in my entire life. Can I find it in the Bible? If not, well, would Jesus do it? And yet there's six more to be able to use. Number three, am I being a good example while I do it? Am I letting my light shine, Matthew 5 and verse 14? Am I setting a good example for other believers in purity and love and faith and speech? In other words, am I setting my light out there so it attracts others to Jesus Christ? Are you being a good example? Number four, would I want everyone else to know I did it? You know, Luke 8 says everything secret is going to one day be revealed. Actually, Ecclesiastes says the exact same thing. Everything is secret is going to be revealed. Do I want everyone else to know I did it? The websites that you visit, the movies you watch, 
the material you read, the songs that you listen to, are you okay with us putting all that on the projector at church? That's the idea. Would I want everyone else to know? That's called integrity, by the way. The righteous man, Proverbs 20, we put it up there a while ago, walks in his integrity. And you know what will happen when a, when a man or a woman walks in his integrity? His children will be right behind him because they want authentic. They want things to be authentic. We are in a world right now with these younger generations. They don't want church. They don't like church because they think it's all hypocrites. And I'm like, well, welcome to society. You are too, right? We, we, all, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. They want people, though, that will set a good example, even in their private life. Number five, could it hurt my body? This body is not yours. I know you've been told this before. This body is not yours. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. It's temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, glorify God. Honor Him. Lift Him up. Make Him happy with this temple. It's His. And you know what? We know that that's not spiritual. Well, that's the physical body that He's talking about in 1 Corinthians 6 because contextually, He's talking about sexual immorality. He's talking about the body. He actually talks about the stomach, that food is made for the stomach and the stomach for food, but your body is not made for sexual immorality. Right? And he says, these words glorify God with your body. Make him happy with this temple that he gave you to use because it's his, not yours. Number six, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, right? Would I want it done to me? That's another great question to see if it's right or wrong. Would I want, it, would I want someone to come to me with this situation or this attitude or whatever it is. And number seven, is it putting God first? Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Are you truly putting God first in what you're saying and what you're doing and how you're living? And then number eight, you know one God-like quality that he put in you? And by the way, the most militant atheist out there has the same quality you have. It's just been damaged. You have a moral code, a moral compass in you. We call it the conscience. I mean, when you're, that's the idea, you're, you're made in the image of God. But not just you, everyone out there is made in the image of God. And you know on a lot of things that I'm just not sure if this is right, then, then don't do it. If it has an appearance of evil to it, Paul says abstain from every appearance, anything that looks like evil. Stay away from it. And i got to tell you, those eight things, they did it for me. It covered everything. It covered lying and, you know, putting things into my body that I shouldn't and Growing up, you know, living in a small town, the beer parties they were having or missing worship or abortion or dancing or premarital sex or violent video games or divorce or pornography or homosexuality or dating or gossip or TV shows and commercials. It covered everything. All I had to do is go through just a couple of these in my head because we, as kids, we had to memorize them. I got them on a card. We had to memorize them, these eight things, so that I could see that sin is black and white. But... We need good discernment, and these eight things help with good discernment. Here's number two. The second thing that your children ought to see is an unshakable faith. Do they see us heed the words of Paul, the Apostle Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, and unshakable faith. Do they see that in me? Do they see that when things get tough, that we're going to be long-suffering while trusting in God and letting God work. During times of disaster and disappointment, divorce, devastation, whatever it is, 
that we practice the words of James when he says in James chapter 1, to consider it all joy when you fall into various trials and temptations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Endurance. The word hupomene. Triumph fortitude. It's the idea of, of not just hanging in there. Hupomene is, you're not just hanging in there, but you're letting God turn this thing into glory. That's the great thing about the God that you serve, brethren. That God has the ability to take stuff that you've messed up or that has messed up in your life. And it may be a circumstance that was totally out of your control. And if you will hang in there and let him, he will turn that into something glorious. You might be in a situation and it's totally upside down. Everything's messed up about it. And you don't know which way to go. We talked about last night when, when reason can't wait anymore, then faith starts to swim. When things get too deep because I can't reason this out, I can't see through it, I don't know what's going on, then faith starts to swim because we walk by faith, not by... That's exactly right. Hupamene, triumphant fortitude. I'm going to let God work in this mess. Maybe it's a phone call from the doctor. Maybe you found out that your great-grandchild has cancer. What am I going to do with this? Your children need to see something. They need to see an unshakable faith in you that you're going to keep on keeping on no matter what. My good friend, the late brother Avon Malone, used to talk about the tale of two frogs. Two frogs fell into a can of milk, or so I've heard it so. The sides of the can were shiny and steep. The milk was deep and cold. Oh, what's the use, cried number one. Tis fate, no helps around. Goodbye, my friend. Goodbye, sad world. And weeping still, he drowned. But number two, a sterner stuffed dog pouted in surprise. And while he wiped his milky face and dried his milky eyes, I'll swim a while, he said, or so I heard it said. Wouldn't really help the world if one more frog were dead. So he kicked and swam and swam and kicked. Not once he stopped to mutter, but he kicked and swam and he swam and kicked and he hopped out via butter. <laughs> I love that. You know, that's Hoopa Mene. That's going, you know what? I don't know what's going to happen here, but I'm going to fight all the way to the end. That's what the Apostle Paul did. Second Timothy chapter four. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. And you know what's laid before me? The crown of righteousness that the righteous judge gives to me. And not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing, who are waiting for his appearing. They need to see that in you, an unshakable faith. It's the faith that Job had. Job 19, 25. When a woman, his own wife, is telling him to curse God and die, and yet he knows that his Redeemer lives. That's the faith. When you can't make sense of things. See, that's what faith is about. I mean, it, it, it ceases to be faith if you can understand it. And if you can see through it. That's not faith. Our children need to see that. It's a faith found in Psalm 31. When David says, have mercy on me, O Lord, for I'm in trouble. My eye wastes away with grief and my soul and my body. My life is spent with grief and my years is sighing. My strength fails because of iniquities and my, bone wa my bones waste away. I'm a reproach among my enemies and especially among my neighbors. I'm repulsive to my acquaintances. Those who see me outside flee from me. I'm forgotten like a dead man. I'm out of my mind. I'm like a broken vessel. For I, f I hear the slander of many and fears on every side. And while I take counsel together, while they take counsel together against me, they scheme to take my life. But as for me, O oh Lord, I trust in you, O oh Lord, because you're my God. That's the kind of faith they need to see. Or the faith that Daniel had. Daniel 3. It says, if that's the case, our God who whom we serve is able to del deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. Right, Daniel's friends. And he will deliver us from your hand. But, O king, if not, let it be known to you, O king, that, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image that you have set up. 
It's, it's the even if not faith. They need to see that in me. An unshakable faith. Number three, a steadfast commitment. A steadfast commitment. A c- commitment to the kingdom of God. Just like David, Psalm 23, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You can't remove me from this. This is where I belong. This is where I stay. My, my parents showed me this. They said, you sure can. You sure can be in the band and you can be in basketball. Those were the two things we were in. But son, you just need to know right off the bat that no, no matter what, if, if there's practice or a game on Wednesday night, you're going to be at Bible study with the rest of the saints. There, there was no argument about it. See, this idea, this kind of commitment is, is that we have non-negotiables in our home, right? Brethren, isn't that right? That there, there are things that we're not going to do because we're children of God. And so I, I so pity the families that have to argue week in and week out with their children about whether they're going to come to Bible class or not. What do you mean we're going to argue? We're not going to argue about this. This is where we belong. We're going to be with the people of God at the church house studying our Bibles Every Sunday morning, every Wednesday night, it's a non-negotiable. Why? Because we're sold out. We're slaves to the king. We belong to him. He is number one. Nothing else is number one in this life. I don't care if it costs. I don't care if I have to give up things. Commitment to the kingdom. Listen, commitment to our marriage. Ephesians 5. It's the idea of wives. Are you submissive to your husbands as to the Lord? Wives, can you say that we gave when we wanted to receive? We served when we wanted to feast and we shared when we wanted to keep. We listened when we wanted to talk. We submitted when we wanted to reign. We forgave when we wanted to remember. We stayed when we wanted to leave. Wives, are you committed to your husbands as to the Lord? Husbands, are are you committed? Do you love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her? Husbands, are are you a one-woman man with your thoughts and with your eyes and with your body? Are you committed to, to, to that woman for the rest of your days? Or are we liars like so many Christians out there? who make that covenant before men and God, who stand before a crowd of people and say, I do, I will, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, till death. That is, are you a liar about that? Or are we, are we really committed? Are, are we men and women of our word no matter what? You see, we're called to be totally committed to God, to have no other gods before him. The question is, does God have rivals in your home? Because God doesn't do rivals. No other gods. Not the God of sports, the God of work, the God of entertainment, the God of materialism, money, the God of recreation, the God of family, the God of popularity, the God of media. No God, no other gods. He's not going to battle for first place. He's just not going to do it. He never has and he never will. He will always be the one and only. You see, in this race, Jesus is the only one running. There's no other competition. The minute that we put competition out on the track to compete against Jesus, Jesus goes, you can have it. You can have it. Because it's all in or all out. Every single time. Right? You've heard the story about the judgment day. When when everyone is separated into the sheep and the... That's exactly right. And the sheep are going to go off with Lord Jesus and reign with him. And the goats are going to go off with Lord Devil. That's their Lord. 
And everyone said, and there's a big fence right in the middle of the separation. Right? And there's one man that climbs on the fence and sits in the middle. And after they all go off and disappear, Satan comes back and he says, oh, I've been looking for you. There you are. And he goes, nope. I'm neither with you nor with him. I'm both. I'm riding the fence. And he goes, oh, no, no. What you don't understand is that I own the fence, Satan says. You're really with me. See, there's no fence straddling with Jesus. If we're on the fence, we're with Satan. And he is our Lord. He's the one that reigns. Because it's an all-in or all-out proposition. That's why Jesus told you before you became a Christian, you need to count the cost before you do this. Because if you want to be my disciple, you, you got to hate your mother and your father. By the way, that's not my words. Don't hold me against it. Jesus says, you must hate your own life. The idea is, it's a comparison of love. It doesn't mean to despise. That would, right? We study scripture based on other scripture. That's good Bible study. And we know that word does not mean to despise the people in our lives. It just simply means, you love me so much, it looks like you hate your own family and your own life. You, you have that much love for me. Have you count the cost? Well, that, that's the kind of commitment that we're talking about. Last of all this morning, for this lesson, the home is a training ground. Your children deserve to not just see commitment, but also the home as a training ground. It's not just a place to eat and sleep. Your child will not get all the training that he or she needs from the church. Not supposed to. It's not set up that way. That's why he told us, as we mentioned a while ago, Proverbs 22 and verse 6, to train up a child in the way he should go. That's my job. And you know where it starts. Brethren, Ephesians 6, 4, where does it start? Fathers. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. I've looked at that multiple times in the English lang or the uh, Greek language, and it still says, it says fathers in there. Now you go, yeah, but I'm, I'm the mom doing it on my own. Then, then it's your role. That, that's your role. I mean, look at Lois and Eunice, right, with Timothy. They were the ones that brought that boy to Christ Jesus and created a spiritual champion there. But if you are a man sitting in this audience and you are the man of your home, the husband of your home, in other words, the cultivator of your house, it's your job to make your home a spiritual training ground, a place where the children know that there is a war going on. There's a war at school. There's a war with society. There's a war with Satan. And we must train them and not have them outsourced to some other person. We, we can't treat this as if we're going to send them and put them on a team and let the coach train them. That's not, that's not the concept of Scripture. It's my job. Can we get help from the church? Sure we can. Support? Absolutely. Resources? You betcha. I've got a whole other lesson that I didn't even bring talking about seven things that the church needs to do better for their families. There are things we need to do better for our families. Some of that's resources. I'm a big proponent of providing family, having a family. We have this huge facilities all over the nation of churches like this. Can you imagine fam a family coming in here? They struggle. They're struggling with the raising their children or their marriage or for fi with finances or whatever. But there's this beautiful resource room just for parents just for families, to be able to come in and check out a book or something free that they can, we can help them raise their children in the Lord. You betcha, the church is good for that.
but it still falls on my shoulders. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. And may I say this right here? You always kind of wonder, what is that idea? What is provoking your children to wrath? What provokes them to wrath? I don't know exactly. There's probably two or three ways that we could take that and apply it. But I know for sure one thing. The father who's not there, who's an absentee father, comes in every once in a while to discipline, to try to do a little something, that will sure enough, that will, that's a surefire way of bringing a child to wrath is when he's absent. It's just food for thought. So that home is a training ground. It's exactly what Deuteronomy 6 and verse 7 says, that it's our job to do it right there in the home, day in and day out. When you rise, when you lie down, when you walk, when you go, all day, every day, the home is a training ground. That's why we have devotional time in our home, worship time, prayer time, Time where we're training our children how to worship. You see, the corporate worship's much more sweeter when they learn how to worship in our home, in a private setting. That's the training ground. How to use their manners, how to be honorable, all that stuff in the home. Brethren, as we close this morning, is your family ready for Jesus to come? Have they seen in your home that sin is black and white? Have they seen a deep, abiding faith, a steadfast commitment, an unwavering commitment? And have they seen a home where they're to be trained to be godly people? He was a typical driven young man. He was on the fast track in his chosen profession and he wrote these words as we close he said it occurred first in 1969 i was running at an incredible speed running at an incredible speed working myself to death like every other man that i knew i once worked 17 nights straight without being home in the evening our five-year-old daughter would stand in the doorway and cry in the morning knowing that she won't see me until the next sunrise. Although my activities were bringing me professional achievement and the trappings of financial success, my dad was not impressed. He had observed my hectic lifestyle and felt obligated to express his concern. And so while flying from Los Angeles to Hawaii one summer, my dad used that quiet opportunity to write me a lengthy letter. It was to have a sweeping influence on my life. He says, let me quote one paragraph from his message, which is especially powerful. Danae, referring to our daughter, is growing up in the most wicked section of the world, much further gone into moral decline than the world in which you were born, my son. I have observed that the greatest delusion is to suppose that our children will be devout Christians simply by or because their parents have been or that any of them will enter into the Christian faith in any other way than through their parents' deep travail of faith and prayer. But this prayer demands time, time that cannot be given if it's all signed and, um, signed and laid on the altar of career ambition. Failure for you, my son, at this point would make mere success in your op occupation a very pale and washed out affair indeed. And so James Dobson continued with these words. Those words written without accusation or insult hit me like the blow from a hammer. Because it was James Dobson's father who saw him pushing through his career and leaving his family behind. So I want to leave you with this. If you want to see your children and your children's children come to really know Christ over the next several generations, it's going to take more than saying grace before dinner or sitting in a pew on Sunday morning. There are no shortcuts. Our faith must be deliberately passed down. It must. This weekend, today, may be a, a revolutionary day for you 
a day of conviction, a day of change. May we not leave here this weekend forgetting these things. Because one day we're going to be held accountable and your children will be held accountable. What have we done? What have they seen in our home?